Leno's here, so give it up for him one more time. Thanks, man. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, we have a screen behind us. I want to say welcome to those online that are joining us on our online campus today. Can you give it up for our online campus today that are joining us this morning? from all over the place, so thanks for being here. And uh, listen, this message is for you too, and at the end I'm going to give you some instructions on how you can uh, experience similar to what we're going to experience here today. Once again, we're expecting, right? We're expecting God. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. See, understand this. These people, these disciples that Jesus had told, these are the ones that Jesus told to go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the Advocate. Wait for the Spirit that's going to come. They knew what water baptism was all about. They, they knew about water baptism, but they needed to experience and encounter the Spirit of God. They needed this, and Jesus knew they needed this. That's why Jesus said, I have to leave, and this is something you want me to do, because when I leave, I'm going to send you something better. You think, wait a minute, better than Jesus? Listen, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what he was going to do. And yes, what he was sending was going to take them to a depth that he couldn't because he was still flesh. He was still human there. So it was the power of God. They needed power. They needed intimacy, different than they had ever experienced with Jesus. They needed the Holy Spirit. Watch this. So Pentecost came, Acts chapter 2, we see this take place. Now remember, I, I talked last week about how some things, some, some misconceptions about all this throughout the years have been taught in the church. And one of those is that that was for then, not for now. That's one. Another one is that was, that was something that died with the apostles. So the day of Pentecost took place, that was the last time. There's no other reason to think that it could happen again. Flip with me to Acts chapter 10, okay? Acts chapter 10, verse 43 through 49. Listen to this. All the prophets testify testify about him that everyone who believes in receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Jesus, we all know this, right? How many thankful for Jesus? Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they had heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So we ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So... When I'm looking at this, I love this part in verse 45 that says, The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. On the day of Pentecost, that was all Jewish people. The Jews gathered together and received it. Then what happens? Then we see, wait a minute, this can't just be for them because if they see that it's just for them, then they won't seek me. They won't try to figure this thing out. They won't come after me anymore. So what do I have to do? I'm going to use Peter, the one who denied Jesus, then gets filled with the Holy Spirit and power and walks around preaching the gospel with, with fire. He's preaching, and while he's speaking, the Gentiles get filled with the Holy Spirit right then. So what God is doing is he's saying it is for the Jewish people, it is for the Gentiles, it is for every person with breath on the planet to receive the power that I have for them. There are teachings that suggest that Acts 2 was a one-time experience never to be repeated. But this portion of scripture shows you that's false. That's not biblical. In Acts 10, the gift of the Holy Spirit came on all the listeners of Peter's message that day. Came on all of them. This was not the continuation of a blessing at Pentecost. This was not a continuation. This was a new encounter at another time. There were 120 at Pentecost that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
If that was the only time that would ever happen, then these that Peter spoke to sometime later would have never experienced that. So when you read the Bible and you look at this whole tongues thing, this whole filled with the Holy Spirit thing, you see a few different, different uh, areas in the Word where you see this take place. There are two, actually, where uh, two manifestations take place, and they're different, but they have the same kind of look to them. The first one, Acts chapter 2, which we just talked about when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. When Peter came to the Gentiles in Acts 10, we see where it happens there. Those two things were the same kind of experience, same kind of thing that took place. But then you have a second one. And this is where the church sometimes blends these two together because we just don't think about it or don't know. And that's okay. That's what we're talking about today. But the second one is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a corporate setting. Okay, so there's a difference there because what Paul's doing is he's teaching the Corinthian church how to work and how to allow God to operate through them in the gifts of the Spirit. Think about it like this. Acts was a personal experience. Corinthians was a public experience. Okay, there's, this is the two, there's two dividing parts here. Paul was teaching the Corinthian church how to properly operate in the gifts of the Spirit because they were calling attention to themselves rather than edifying the church. So they needed instruction on what this looks like. This wasn't the private prayer time. This wasn't the private prayer language. This was something that took place in a corporate setting, and they were going a little bonkers with it. They didn't get it. Praying in tongues is what we're going to look at today. Some of you just automatically went, Ugh. don't, because we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. This carries a different function as a gift. Tongues is, an expressed, is expressed in a language grounded in prayer. It develops an intimacy with God that only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. I want to explain something to you. Speaking in tongues is a conscious choice. Listen. This means that you are not taken over by a manifestation, but rather it is us allowing the Holy Spirit to manifest himself through us. You hear the utterances within you, then you choose to speak them. God does not force himself on you. So let's look at this scientifically for a minute. Let's get out of the church world, get out of the Bible world, and let's look at this scientifically for a minute. University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Andrew Newberg conducted a study. He wanted to measure the brain while participants, while people spoke in tongues. He wanted to measure the brain. Who does that? Who just thinks about that, you know? But this is what he said he wanted to do. So while... While the subjects spoke in tongues, subjects, participants, people, whatever you want to call them, while they spoke in tongues, their brains were scanned, and the results were this. Their frontal lobe, the area responsible for language, went completely dark. Now listen. Participants said that while speaking in tongues, they are not conscious of what they are saying, meaning that they don't formulate the language, but they are aware of the words coming out of their mouth. Now understand this. This is the problem with the thought patterns. People think that when you do that or when you, get ex when you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you immediately black out and you don't know where you were and you wake up in another place smelling like cigarette smoke or something. Yeah, I went there because that's the craziness that we think about sometimes. We've got to get simple and understand God has something for us today. If we complicate it so much, what's going to happen? We're going to miss out on what he has. But this goes along with the Bible. Let's put the Bible into, into this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 14, listen. For if I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays. Remember, we talked about this the first week. Our spirit and the Holy Spirit come together and creates an infilling. The spirit of God takes over our spirit, the inside of us. 
If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. It's exactly what the doctor said took place. They knew they were saying something. They didn't know what they were saying. It wasn't fruitful for the person hearing it. But it's our spirit connecting with God's spirit. This is different from other religions and faith that speak a language while in meditation where the same study was taking place and the frontal lobes were active while their words were uttered in those participations. So the question comes, what does a believer need to do to receive this? We talk about it all the time, but let's get practical this morning. Let's talk about how. How can we do this? So I want to give you a few tips today on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to pray. Does that work? Number one, believe that it's for you. Believe that it's for you. Acts chapter 2 tells us it's for us. Acts chapter 10 tells us it's for everybody. It's not just for a select few. But this is not something that you write on a bucket list or a Christmas list. Don't seek the gift. Seek the giver. The one who gives you this gift is so much greater than what you receive. Speaking in tongues is a byproduct of the infilling and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a byproduct. It's not something we want. It's something that happens when we receive the fullness of God. Here's why I say that. The byproduct is an overflowing that is in your life. If you remember last week, I had the jar of water and the water inside of it was what's already there upon salvation. The Spirit of God comes in. But when the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place, it begins to come out. It begins to erupt inside of you because you can't contain it on your own. If you aren't full of desperation for more of him, you won't receive what he has for you. Let me explain the word receive. The definition of the word receive is to be given, pre- present with, Or paid something. God presents us all with this. It is up to us to receive it. If someone gives you a gift, you have to receive it or you don't get it, right? Now, think about when when I go to my grandmother's house. I knew there was gifts there. But if I walked in and said, yep, I don't want them. It doesn't mean that she don't have them for me. It just means I didn't receive them. I didn't take those. Do you understand what I'm saying? God says, I have this for you. I have this encounter. I have this experience for you. If you don't take it, you don't get it. It's not that God has not given it to us. It's that we're not receiving what he has for us. Salvation is the same way. Salvation is offered to us. If we don't receive salvation, we don't get it. Everybody with me? Remember who the source of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Number two, hunger and thirst. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This should be the cry of our hearts, that we are filled with all God has for us because it brings us closer to him. That is the only reason. That is the only reason I want more of God, so I can get closer to him. You can't earn it. That's why it's called a gift. If you grew up in a Pentecostal church, it doesn't mean that you're first in line to receive this. The Ephesian disciples in Acts chapter 19 was asked by Paul, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They hadn't. If you read this, the scripture, they had not. So Paul taught them. He taught them. You know all these preconceived ideas we have of the wackiness? Paul taught them. And they laid hands on them, and they received and spoke in tongues, is what the Bible says. I think there's, there's such a lack of teaching in the church today, and that's one reason we get this idea of these craziness. We need to teach more. We need to talk about this more. It's okay to talk about it. Churches today talk about the Holy Spirit like they talk about money. Somebody should have said amen on that one. Amen. Can't talk about money. Can't talk about the Holy Spirit. What are we going to stick to then? Number three, you got to be open to God. 
In Acts chapter 1 and 2, those who received were in a prayer meeting seeking after God. In Acts 10, they were receiving the message from Peter and were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, they received as they were being prayed for by Paul. Do you understand this? They were open to what God had. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait. Okay, I'm going to Jerusalem and waiting. I'm open to whatever you have, God. Boom, power of the Holy Spirit falls. Peter's preaching this message. What's happening? They're all sitting there receiving what he's saying. They're open to what he's saying. They're Gentiles. Then what happens? Power of the Holy Spirit comes. In Acts chapter 19, you see where that Paul was praying for people. They were open to whatever God had. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. It's still happening, and it's for you. Just like those in Jerusalem and Ephesus at the home of Cornelius, you can receive that power from on high to be witnesses for Jesus anywhere you go. Number four, expectation. Expectation. Expectation leads to impartation. Bite with me on that one. It's a bunch of big words there. Expectation leads to impartation. <laughs> I expected the gifts of my grandmother, and I received them. I was, they were imparted. They were given to me. I expect God to show up. There's an impartation that's going to take place upon that expectation. A lame man was begging on the street. Peter and John walked by. Acts 3, 5 says the man looked up expecting to get something from them. He looked up expecting to receive something. Then Acts chapter 3, verse 6 and 8. Then Peter said, as he's looking at him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. It was an expectation that met, led to an impartation of what God had for them. How do we live our lives? Do we look up expecting to receive from God? Anything we receive from the Lord begins with our looking up in expectation. We get nothing without expectation. So what do you struggle with? What is damaged? What is missing? God is ready for a total transformation. His mercy and grace are readily available to help us in our time of need. Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem and wait. Wait in expectation about what I'm going to send. Every story of the infilling of the Holy Spirit or healing or salvation throughout the Word of God begins with an expectation. They all do. Your story, your story of salvation begins with an expectation my life is ruined I'm at the bottom of my I'm at the bottom of the pit right now if something don't happen if God doesn't show up I don't know what I'm going to do there's this desperation there's this expectation that he's going to show up in your life Believe, hunger, and thirst. Be open to God and expect Him to show up. That's the keys. That's the simple keys. Just a couple minutes, we're going to have this altar open. And I'm going to give you some instructions. Before we do that, I want to talk to the online, those joining us online this morning. If you're here this morning online... You think, well, you know, we're, we're live here and there's people in the room and we're going to pray for them and all that kind of thing. But let me tell you something. Right where you're at, you can experience God. I remember when I had this experience. In 1997, I was by myself. No one was pushing on my forehead. No one was kicking the legs out from under me so I'd fall down. I was just praying. I was just talking to Jesus. I wasn't even praying for this. I was just talking to God. At that moment, God came down 
and did this amazing thing in my life. He can do it for you too. So wherever you're sitting, I'm about to dismiss you because we're going to have a time of prayer here. But before I do, I want to encourage you, right where you're sitting, just begin to talk to God. Just begin to love Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus and see what happens. Just keep going after him. It's not rocket science. It's not some kind of formulated prayer that we got to do. It's simply us opening our hearts and saying, I'm open to whatever it is you have. So right there where you're at, if you're in a computer screen, if you're on your phone, whatever you may be, find time. If you can't do it right now, do it later today or whatever. But just find that time to say, God, I'm open to whatever it is you have for me. And don't stop praying that. Don't stop being vulnerable before God. Don't stop expecting him to do something. Thank you for joining us today. Love you. We'll see you next week. Make sure you join us.